All right, Mike, let's talk about the gold new deal. What What is this? So not the green new deal. You've got a gold new deal. Tell us what this is. It certainly is not the Green New Deal, and it's not the original New Deal that FDR put forward in the 30s that I think really undermined the idea that we live in a constitutional nation. The idea of the Gold New Deal is that we need a new relationship between us and government, that we should not be tolerating the style of governance that has been shoved upon us. The, the flagship of the idea the flagship of the relationship is to decentralize power down to the states and from the states down to individual localities. The, the big idea here is that we need a, a pathway, probably uh, through federal legislation, possibly uh, supplemented with a constitutional amendment, but we need a, a way for states to unilaterally nullify a number of federal laws and to unilaterally settle disputes in state court between federal law and state law. So in this sense, what I'm advocating for is states to be able to sunset federal supremacy in their own state. There is, as you know, a lot of movement in a number of areas toward the idea of secession. And however you feel about secession, I personally don't think it's the, the most politically viable, the most logical move for states to make, although I do stand up for states' rights to, to secede if they find it necessary. Sure. What I'm suggesting is there's a better way. If you can get yourself out from underneath federal supremacy and chart your own political future, the world can be better for you. And you can remain as a, a part of the United States, but subject to a much different relationship with the federal government. I so you want to you want to really eliminate a lot of that. Well, and I think that's like, like a fairly standard libertarian principle, right, is to really reduce the federal government and uh, and maybe even government in general, but certainly the federal government. Would you, when you say gold new deal, are you talking, that to me speaks of like going to back to uh, gold backed currency, ending the Fed, like, is that part of this gold new deal? It is a part of the, the deal to eliminate the Federal Reserve System. We don't have to go all the way back to a gold standard. Okay. Uh, gold represents the gold color of the Libertarian Party. But okay. yes, to your point, we want what I call a rules-based system. You know, this is something that Dr. Paul talked about in ending the Federal Reserve System. We need to get out from under this silly idea of a discretionary uh, monetary policy where every six weeks we lock up 18 politically oriented economists in a room and we ask them what mood they're in and they decide what interest rate should be and by how much we should be increasing our money supply. Yeah. Rather than that, I believe that there should be rules about setting how much money is in our economy and let the markets determine what interest rates ought to be. And research has shown that we would do a much better job of eliminating, at least mollifying, the boom-bust cycle than we have in the past. And with all due respect to people who have backed the Federal Reserve System, I think empirically speaking, over the past 100 years, we have proven that the system just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Best efforts, lots of smart people, notwithstanding, it, the system doesn't work. And so we need to replace it lock, stock and barrel. It's a, a fundamentally but, different style. I mean, there have been fewer runs on banks, I would imagine. Since the Federal Reserve, there's been fewer, so fewer runs on banks. Uh, people aren't losing all of their money like they, they once did. You know, you put your money in a bank, the bank could just, especially, so I'm all about ending the Fed, I think, but I'm not an economist. So I think there's a lot of merit in in ending that, that system. It's certainly at least uh, reducing their power on the actual economy. Like you said, just deciding willy nilly what the interest rate's going to be or whatever, uh, and, and bailing out the big banks and leaving the people high and dry. So I, I definitely think there at least needs to be some reform there. But I'm I'm wondering what would happen if we truly ended it. And then banks, I don't trust banks. I don't trust individual banks. I don't trust that they're going to work in my best interest. And I worry that they're going to 
without a federal reserve that they have to answer to that kind of controls their behavior, I worry that they would then run amok and that people would get swindled by the banks. Well, you should worry. You should worry about any giant organization that doesn't have good governance policies in place. Most banks today are not directly regulated by the Federal Reserve System. They are regulated either by their state uh, or uh, by the Treasury Department, uh, including the FDIC. And so that regulatory apparatus could remain in place for any financial institution. I would make government regulation completely optional for every financial institution. If a financial institution rather preferred to go out and hire a private sector auditor, I think that that would be uh, fine. Mm -hmm. I think that people would react. You know, we live in a very different environment than we did 100 years ago in terms of information flow, what we know about financial institutions. There are agencies out there that do a very good job of rating organizations. By the way, there are agencies out there that do a crappy job as well. But there are uh, auditing firms and agencies out there that do a good job of spreading information about financial institutions. Even the big brokerage houses do a better job of reporting the financial health of banks than the federal government does. Mm -hmm. A better job than the Federal Reserve System does. So in that sense, I don't think that there would be a great deal of loss in terms of pass through information to us as investors and us as depositors. I think your concern is well placed, but I don't think it's the Federal Reserve System itself that stands between us and financial catastrophe. I think it is the banks uh, answering to someone, yes, but I believe Mm -hmm. that they should be able to answer to a private sector auditor if they should choose that path. I mean, in one way, there would be a. I, I do think that we've we we've kind of uh, become mindless, right, in our day to day. We don't pay attention. Like I just assume my money is safe in the bank. I'm not paying much attention to my bank. I'm not paying much attention to any of that. I'm just making these assumptions. Right. If we were to kind of reel that back and and go into this direction, people would be forced to pay more attention to which institution they're putting their money in, how they're rated, how they're doing. Yep. Right. There would be they, they, they would want to actually pay attention to the audits. The only thing, though, is that in all honesty, only smart people are going to do that. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are not as intelligent to no fault of their own. It's just the way that it is. And we just have to be honest about that. But then there's also just people who are busy and they don't have time to pay attention to any of that. They've got a bunch of kids, full time jobs, lives, and they just can't be sitting there reading audit reports. Right. So right. It's, so the, the problem with these types of systems is in only the the intellectual class that's sitting in front of a computer all day would have time to actually research and pay attention while the working class Americans would suffer and potentially put their money in a bad bank and get swindled you know so it just continues to hurt the poor as long as you as long as we're talking about people with less than $200,000 of deposits you could continue to rely on the FDIC banks okay. choose FDIC insurance Uh, They pay for FDIC insurance and the FDIC audits them. Mm -hmm. By the way, the FDIC is completely funded uh, by bank money, by private sector money. It's just that it's a government agency that is subject to all kinds of political influences that are completely inappropriate. Truly, the FDIC should be spun off as a completely private sector organization, seeing as the resources that fund the FDIC are completely from the private sector anyway. So to your point, uh, banks that take retail deposits, whether that number is uh, set at 100,000 or 200,000, banks that take retail deposits could remain in the the same regime that they are today, Mm -hmm. audited by the FDIC and uh, insured by the FDIC, because your point is is very important. There are a lot of people that don't want to pay any more attention than they do today to the health of their financial institution but they would be able to rely on the FDIC going forward. I would get rid of uh, the F uh, in FDIC and just make it a deposit insurance corporation and keep it in the private sector. Okay. So what about, would, would this, if we did eliminate the Fed, would this, would this reel us into multiple currencies, like state currencies? I don't think it needs to. Uh, you know, we don't have to give up on the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar today is the only international reserve currency. And so in that sense, it's a huge asset to the people of the United States. 
parenthetically, it's a huge asset to the rest of the world as well. I wish we lived in a world of competitive currencies. I wish something would grow up and, and challenge the U.S. dollar. But there is nothing anywhere near, you know, a distant second place might be the euro and, you know, the British pound. And they are right. distantly uh, behind the U.S. dollar. Well, and the I government think, makes it a point to crush anything else that even start like like uh, crypto that starts to come up. Now we're, you know, they they start to do things that are uh, like how they uh, with Silicon Valley Bank and uh, Signature Bank of New York, you know, just these false phony collapses. That's right. And I worry that if the Fed is allowed to do so, it is poised on the edge of issuing its own cryptocurrency, its own blockchain based right. currency. And I think that that is uh, really a mistake, not only from the privacy concerns that we all have as Americans, particularly as libertarians, the idea that the Fed would have access to information on every transaction on that blockchain. And yeah. I think no one believes that the Fed would resist the request from the Treasury Department or the Justice Department for that data. You know, I think your data is going to get spread around. But the other concern I have is that if the Fed does enter this market of issuing its own cryptocurrency at a retail level, to your point, it would undermine other currencies and it would bias the way that these markets develop. And that would be a, a, a real shame because the Fed would necessarily set up rules that make it difficult for anyone else to compete. Yeah. Hmm. Um, on your website, you have at uh, MikeTermat.com, you have an interesting page here, candidate comparison. And you've got Joe Biden, yourself, and Donald Trump. And you've got White House experience, all three of you, yes. Entrepreneurial success, no for Joe Biden, yes for you, yes for Donald Trump. What did you do that was uh, entrepreneurial? I launched uh, my own business in uh, providing education for financial services executives, uh, a lot of bankers. We provided strategic consulting. This is uh, from 2002 to 2010. Uh, or so. Uh, a partner of mine and I were in the business of hosting events, uh, providing uh, online education. These are the old days of online education. Uh, webinars, we used to call them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, providing those services and strategic consulting to nonprofits and some financial institutions. And we ran that business for about seven or eight years. We merged into another company that eventually went bankrupt. So no, we didn't get disgustingly rich, which is a real shame. Uh, but it was something that put all of our kids through college. And for that, we were very grateful for the opportunity to be out on our own. You learn a lot running your own business, as you damn well know, Kim. Yeah. Being out on your own uh, sharpens one's instinct for uh, being careful about business decisions, that's for sure. Um, okay, economics, it says right here, Bidenomics is for Biden, Austrian school for yourself, and America first for Donald Trump. It's, what is the difference between those three? An Austrian is someone who is very skeptical of the government's ability to do anything right, for that matter, but particularly to process information and to affect markets. Bidenomics is all about the opposite, using the government to dictate how certain things work. It's why it has such a robust regulatory regime and tries to increase that every chance it can get, as well as to affect markets by directly putting money into people's pockets, right? We saw you know, coming off of COVID, all of the uh, checks that were mailed out. And, and so those two are sort of opposites. America first uh, under Donald Trump is really the idea of what we used to call a couple of hundred years ago, mercantilism, the idea that the object of the game is to sell as much stuff as, as possible. And Donald Trump believes more in selling stuff than services, which is an even weirder twist on mercantilism. He doesn't believe in free trade. He believes in making it difficult for Americans to buy things from abroad. And uh, I am all about free trade. Free trade is what it takes to boost our economy as much as possible. And by the way, is the right foreign policy. We should be more engaged with our trading partners around the world, not less engaged, including not only tariffs, but the idea that you brought up sanctioning so many of our trade partners, keeping them from using either the US dollar or clearing houses for the US dollar. I think all of that is wrongheaded 
and uh, a real mess. So I don't believe in biasing our markets in favor of manufacturing uh, or in favor of certain uh, types of trade relationships. But didn't you find during COVID that we were kind of in a, um, we were very much, I think, in a national security crisis with the fact that we couldn't get the goods that we needed from foreign countries when they decided to shut down trade for their own reasons, not because they were at war with us or they didn't like us, right? I mean, China shut down trade because China was worried about COVID for its own country and it was trying to stop its own spread. So yeah. for its own national security reasons, they did that. In doing that, we discovered we were really reliant on Chinese goods. And that put us in a really, uh, I think, a precarious predicament. And if it were something, if COVID were to have gone on longer, if it was something that was a much worse virus, if it were a war, um, that as could it could be, be in the future, right? As right. So, so do you find that, you know, free trade? This this idea of this free trade is really, you know, obviously people have lower standard of living or lower cost of living in other countries, which allows them to manufacture at lower rates, which allows us to import at low rates, which allows Americans to buy cheap goods from Walmart, right? So uh, I don't think Americans want to give that up. And I think what'll, and, and I, and you probably know that, which is why free trade would allow that to continue. But I don't you worry about the risk it puts us in on a national security, you know, from a national security perspective. I do. And I think that that is a, a very logical uh, concern. Where we went wrong was in failing to procure long term contracts to provide the goods that that we found that we needed. We were not ready for that virus uh, in any number of ways. Uh, you know, we can spend the rest of the hour talking about what a crappy job we did in terms of the development of the vaccine and the bad information that was put out, hiding information, the structural problems we have in developing vaccines and the relationship between pharmaceuticals and the government. But setting all that aside just for a moment, uh, yes, we failed to prepare ourselves uh, both in a private sector sense and in a governmental sense in long-term contracting for the goods that we found out, that you point out, that we found out that, that we needed when it really hit the fan. That's a, that's a big mistake. Hey guys, be sure to like, share, and subscribe if you like this segment. Now you might be wondering, this seems like it's part of a bigger show. You're right, it is. The full show is at kimiversonshow.com. So what you're watching is just a clip. And if you wanna get the full experience, then you gotta go to kimiversonshow.com. The show airs Monday through Friday, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern at KimIversonShow.com. That is where you can watch the full show. Here, you just get clips. So click on the link down below. Go to the full show. Enjoy. Otherwise, I'll see you next time right here. And be sure, once again, like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.